Ever since the German group was encircled near Stalingrad, Soviet scouts had been hunting for Paulus, commander of the German 6th Army. Partisans reported that his headquarters was in the village of Golubinska, 150 kilometers from Stalingrad. As Colonel Adam, the adjutant of the commander, later recalled, the shots of the Soviet tank, which broke into the German rear and closed the giant ring of encirclement, were absolutely unexpected for the command of the group and for Paulus himself. Fearing being captured, Paulus, with his headquarters under cover of tanks, left Golubinska at night. It later became known that General Paulus reached Stalingrad and hid in the basement of a former department store, where he was captured later. In this video we will show you the basement, which is now a museum dedicated to the battle for Stalingrad and the capture of Field Marshal Paulus. Friedrich Paulus was a notable figure among the German generals. Hitler declared that victory always goes together with Paulus. Divisions under his command invaded Poland in 1939 and occupied Belgium and the Netherlands in 1940. General Paulus personally developed the monstrous plan codenamed Barbarossa, which included the defeat of the Red Army and the total genocide of the Soviet people during the Blitzkrieg. In the summer of 1942, the powerful group under Paulus' command rushed to Volga and Stalingrad. It would seem that the German troops were only one last shot away from victory. However, the defenders of the city imposed their own tactics on the enemy. Battles were fought for every street, for every house. Red Army divisions fought while in encirclement when Volga was 300 meters away. General Paulus couldn't estimate the scale of preparation of the German troops' encirclement. And now, in late January 1943, after all his dizzying victories, he was sitting in the basement, waiting for his fate. In war, a lot is decided by chance. On January 30, 1943, the staff officer of the 38th Shooting Brigade, Fyodor Ilchenko, arrived at the front line with the next order. The soldiers were fighting hard, advancing to the city center. A German major was captured in one of the houses and was brought to Ilchenko. After interrogation, the German major reported that General Paulus was nearby, in the basement of Stalingrad Central Square. Early morning of January 31, 1943, in the half-darkness, over the square the rockets were slowly going out, lighting with deadly light the huge ruins, poles falling down kicked suits on the edges of funnels. Senior Lieutenant Ilchenko used an interpreter to signal, we propose a ceasefire, we propose to begin negotiation on the surrender of the encircled German army. After a while, a German officer came out of the department store building holding a stick with a white rag. Senior Lieutenant Ilchenko, along with the Lieutenant Mizhirka, an interpreter, and several machine gunners, crossed the front line and entered the square. No one could know what awaited them behind the walls of a building plunged into darkness. Chief of Staff Schmidt told him that Paulus would negotiate only with senior officers equal to him in rank. General Laskin was ordered to go to the basement of the department store. He was in a hurry, since every hour of fighting was taking soldiers' lives. No one was going to listen to any special conditions of surrender from the defeated General Paulus. The Soviet soldiers felt victorious. They had one goal – to accept the complete and unconditional surrender of the German forces in Stalingrad. From General Laskin's story There were five of us. Battalion Commander Latyshev, Interpreter Stepanov, and two machine gunners with me. The order was given to cover us with fire if necessary. 
When we approached the entrance of the building, we saw a dense line of German officers who were closing the entrance to the basement and looking at us sullenly. Even when our group came close to them, they didn't budge. What did we have to do? We shrugged them off the entrance. Afraid of being shot in the back, we began to descend into the dark cellar. When we were in a basement full of Nazis, we didn't know which way we should go. We were moving in silence. We were afraid that the Germans would start firing here in the Russian speech. We were walking in darkness, holding on to the walls, hoping we would eventually stumble upon some kind of a door. At last, we grasped the handle and entered the lighted room. At once, we noticed the shoulder straps of a general or a colonel on the uniforms of the men in the room. I approached the table in the center of the room and said loudly with the help of an interpreter to everyone present, We are representatives of the Red Army. Stand up, surrender your weapons. Some stood up, others hesitated. I sharply repeated the command once more. None of them resisted. One by one the Germans began to call their names. They were the Chief of Staff, General Schmidt, the Commander of the Southern Group of Forces, General Roske, and other top military officers in the room. General Roske stated that Commander Paulus had delegated to him the authority to negotiate. I demanded an immediate meeting with Paulus. That's impossible, Schmidt declared. The commander was elevated by Hitler to the rank of field marshal, but at this time he doesn't command the army. Besides, he is not well. A thought flashed across my mind. Maybe there is some kind of game going on here, and Paulus had time to be transported elsewhere. Gradually, however, during the interrogation of the German generals, it became clear that Paulus was nearby, in the basement. I demanded that Chief of Staff Schmidt go to him and hand over our terms of the German troops' surrender. On my order, Schmidt was followed by combatant Latyshev in order to set up our post at Paulus' office. No one was to be let in or out there. Private Pyotr Altuchov stood at the door. By that time, our group, authorized to accept the surrender of the German troops, had greatly expanded. We were joined by Lukin, the head of the Army's operational department, Ryzhov, the head of the intelligence department, Burmakov, the commander of the 38th Rifle Brigade, and other officers, as well as a group of scout officers. We made a demand to General Schmidt and Roski to immediately order the troops encircled near Stalingrad to cease fire and all resistance. General Roski sat down at his typewriter. In the meantime, our officers began to disarm the German troops. Pistols and machine guns were piled in the corner. It was a truly symbolic picture. We took control of the telephone network that was in the headquarters to keep track of what orders were being given to the troops. General Roske gave us his order text, which he called Farewell. Here is its content. Hunger cold and unauthorized surrender of some units made it impossible to continue leading the troops. To prevent the total death of our soldiers, we decided to negotiate a cessation of hostilities. The Soviet Union guarantees human treatment in captivity and the possibility of returning home after the end of the war. Such an end is the fate to which all soldiers must submit. Orders. Lay down your arms immediately. Soldiers and officers may take all necessary items with them. After reading this order, I told General Roski that it should clearly state all soldiers and officers have to surrender in an organized manner. Roske sat down again at his typewriter and added this important instruction. However, he informed us that they had no communication with the northern group of troops and the fighting there was continuing. Before our eyes, the headquarters of the German army came into motion for the last time in Stalingrad. On many telephones, German communicators in hoarse, cold voices transmitted the order text to the troops. We followed Adjutant Adam into Paulus' office. The basement was small, like a crypt. 
Putting his hands behind his back, the field marshal walked along the concrete wall like a hunted animal. I named myself and declared him a prisoner. Paulus said in broken Russian, apparently a phrase he had prepared long ago. Field Marshal Paulus surrenders to the Red Army as a prisoner. What surprised us then was his statement about his uniform. In this setting, he considered it possible to inform us that only two days ago he had been promoted to Field Marshal. He had no new uniform. So he presented himself to us in the uniform of the Colonel General. Paulus stated that he had read the text of the surrender order and agreed with it. We asked him what Hitler's last orders had been given to him. Paulus answered that Hitler ordered them to fight on the Volga and wait for the tank groups to approach. Since we were told that the German army headquarters had no communication with the group of his troops continuing to fight in the northern regions of Stalingrad, I demanded that Paulus send officers there to deliver the surrender order. But Paulus refused, saying that he was now a prisoner of war and had no right to give orders to his soldiers. After the defeat of the German forces at Stalingrad, Germany declared three days of mourning. Field Marshal Paulus had a dramatic journey in Soviet captivity. In 1944 he would join the Free Germany movement of German officers. Even before the end of the war, Paulus would sign a statement to the German people. For Germany, the war is lost. Germany must renounce Adolf Hitler and establish a new state power that will end the war and create conditions for our people to continue to live and establish peaceful, even friendly relation with our current adversaries. At the Nuremberg trials, Paulus acted as a witness, citing facts that denounced the leaders of the Nazi Reich. By a strange coincidence, he would pass away 17 years after the war, on the next anniversary of the defeat of German forces in Stalingrad.